Well, certainly, I mean, one of the, the you know, the advantages of Bitcoin is that it, it has this pretty long history now of, of going up over time. And so it can be quite volatile. And so in, in developed countries, a lot of people don't get why someone would own Bitcoin uh, other than speculation. And it's because they're used to having pretty uh, stable currencies. Uh, whereas emerging markets, they generally, some of them are currently going through very bad periods of inflation. And other ones generally still have inflation somewhere in their memory over the past, you know, uh, 20 years or so. Uh, whereas the United States, we have to pretty much go back to the 70s to, to you know, have a memory of strong inflation. Uh, and so in, in a lot of those markets, you know, it's, it's in some ways, I think it's an easier selling point of why they might want to hold something that's not their own government currency, uh, that, that can't be debased uh, in any sort of reasonable way uh, or easy way. Uh, and that they, they are owning something that's scarce. Uh, and then, of course, some countries have capital controls. Uh, Bitcoin makes those more difficult to enforce. Uh, and so it means different things to different countries. And obviously, in, in, say, Lebanon, right, they have a much worse inflation problem than many other countries. And so that's, you know, it's a more extreme situation. But across the board, I mean, I think it's one of those things where Bitcoin can benefit, you know, people in every country. But I think it just so happens that emerging markets, I, I think, can get the the, the reasons for it maybe a little bit faster. Do you think you could briefly explain what network effects are um, and how they're useful when researching um, not only Bitcoin, but other assets? Yeah, so network effects are a phenomenon where the more people that use it, uh, the more valuable that the network gets exponentially, right? So if if only five people in the world have phones, a phone is not a very useful invention, but if half the people in the world have phones, then suddenly it's one of the best inventions ever. Uh, and so basically the phone gets exponentially more useful the more people you can call with it. Uh, and so the same is true for email, the same is true for social networks, right? You wouldn't, wouldn't wanna have a social network with almost no one on it. Uh, and so that's generally one of the strongest economic moats that a company or a protocol can have against competition is the fact that they've already achieved network dominance. So I, I could make, for example, I, I could hire a programmer. We make a, uh, like a copy of Facebook. It looks similar, uh, but then I'd have almost no chance to get people to actually use my version of Facebook. Uh, it just I, th there'd be no kind of flywheel to get that started because there's, there's it's a dead zone anyway. Even if I threw a billion dollars at it, I could get probably a couple of million people there, but they would quickly just go back to the you know the real the real major social networks, uh, as an example. Uh, and so that's true. Also, I've used the example of uh, Wikipedia. I could you know you could, Wikipedia you can download the data. I could host it on my website, and it would it would kind of look like Wikipedia, but it wouldn't have the millions of links around the world pointing pointing to it the same way that the real Wikipedia does. That's the thing I can't replicate. That's the network effect. And I also, I can't replicate the fact that there's so many users on Wikipedia updating it. I can't convince them to come update mine instead. And so mine will always be this, this kind of shadow of the real thing. Uh, and so my biggest concern when looking at cryptocurrencies, especially back in 2017, was, okay, so it's open source. Anyone can make a, a copy of it. Uh, and so the whole idea of scarcity is then challenged if someone can just make Bitcoin 2 or Bitcoin 3 uh, and or Ethereum 2. Uh, and so I was like, you know, I, I was concerned that, you know, even if the space takes off, it's neat technology, the capital could go in and just diffuse among like so many different protocols, like basically a permanent alt season where just like everything kind of goes up and down and nothing really kind of accumulates persistent value. Uh, and so, but then I, I kind of just kept studying the space more, and I saw that the network effects apply very strongly to to cryptocurrency. And they generally network effects apply to money in general. I mean, part of why the dollar has hegemony, in addition to just the United States military strength, the history of how we got here, is that it's kind of self-sustaining as a network effect. Uh, and so, you know, there's dollar-denominated debt around the world, including in, in uh, uh, Chile, uh, and. So that basically makes that's demand for dollars, right? Because all these countries need dollars in order to service their dollar denominated debt. Uh, and then out of out of kind of ease, lenders, when they lend more money, they often do it in dollars. They could do it in euro. Sometimes they do. But that dollar has the strongest network effect in that space. And that's why, you know, you know, generally diversifying away from it is a slow process, right? Because it's so entrenched already. Uh, and so with Bitcoin, for example, or, or cryptocurrencies in general, uh, the fact that it's, that the security is tied to the is 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 tied to how popular it is generally, right? So it's it's much harder to attack. That makes it you know more desirable to begin with. So more people stick with it. That makes it even more secure. Uh, and we also see, for example, that more developers work on the top cryptocurrencies. So they get they get better hardware wallets. They get better applications. 
uh, they get better security and, and, and upgrades over time uh, than some of the ones that kind of get left behind. And so we start to see over time that, that cryptocurrencies start to resemble social networks in the sense that they have these network effects and you're going to have, you know, most likely just a small number of them rise to the top and that long tail of thousands of cryptocurrencies, you know, for the most part don't matter. And so the two that I consider to have really strong network effects this time would be Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, whereas the other ones, you know, they, they might have kind of interesting use cases. They're, they're showing interesting technology, uh, but they still haven't, you know, reached a network effect uh, that is, is, is kind of self-sustaining. An example I like to use is, you know, the whole internet runs on TCP IP. Uh, and, you know, they, it could have been, you know, it could have been designed a little bit differently. Someone can make a competing protocol. In fact, there have been competing protocols, but they never catch on because the entire internet's kind of set up to use this, this one method. And so even if I came along and said, hey, I have this this, this method that's like, you know, 5% better than, than TCP IP, people would say, oh, we don't care because the fact that, that none of the websites in the world are going to interact with your protocol already makes your protocol a million times worse, even if it's 5% more efficient. Uh, and so and if anything, TCP IP could maybe kind of incorporate some of my ideas, make, make theirs better, uh, but my protocol would never catch on. Uh, and so generally, basically, in order to disrupt an existing network effect, the up and comer has to be like 10 times better. It has to be like so much better that you, you eventually just can't not switch. It's clearly superior. Uh, and so we and so we see, for example, that these these network effects rise to the top. And then the question is, can they sustain them? Can they upgrade enough to make sure that nothing comes along that's say 10 times better? And then they kind of, you know, remain kind of the kings of the space. Where do you see Bitcoin over the next coming years and decades? So we're starting to see if you, if you do polls of, of, of investors uh, in certain countries, uh, I haven't seen it for the whole world, but I've seen it in, in individual markets. Uh, you know, you're starting to see the fact that as many or more people own cryptos than own gold. Uh, and so and that skews younger. I mean, obviously, if you're if you're in your 30s or 40s or 20s, you're more likely to have that be the case uh, than if you're in your 50s, 60s or 70s. Uh, and so generally we are seeing, uh, you know, a, a, an adoption of it as as kind of a a monetary asset. Uh, and so there's some countries like Singapore that's pretty high uh, and, and whereas other countries are, are pretty low. Uh, but, you know, in, in countries where it has meaningful adoption, it's generally all, it's starting to get higher than gold in many cases. Now, so far, we don't see that among central banks. They're still buying gold. Uh, that's their asset of choice. And that makes sense because even Bitcoin, as big as it is, uh, you know, it peaked at like 1.2 trillion uh, this year so far. Now it's back below a trillion. Uh, Ethereum is is a few hundred billion, uh, and so you know when when, when these markets and they're very volatile. So when these when these central banks are looking at it, uh, you know, imagine from their perspective the disaster where if they buy Bitcoin and then it's fluctuating around and then you know a tail risk happens and and it doesn't work out and then they're like, why did you buy like digits on a computer? What were you thinking? So with like a billion dollars, it's like so they they basically it's not big enough that they can really kind of put meaningful amounts of funds into it. Now I do think that if over time, Bitcoin continues to grow uh, and, and kind of, you know, has, uh, you know, say another kind of, you know, cycle of adoption, another big bull market, it becomes a multi trillion dollar asset class. If you have that network effect continue to take off for maybe over half a billion people in the world own it, maybe a billion people in the world own it, uh, then it starts to get big enough and, and maybe a little bit less volatile and central banks can then start, you know, potentially using it as a reserve asset. I don't think they're going to just dump all their gold and just pour into Bitcoin, but they can, you know, especially some of the smaller countries might start saying, hey, we want to have a non-zero allocation to this other type of asset. Uh, and especially because not only can they store it as an asset like gold, but they can also use it if they need to as a permissionless payment. They can go around all these uh, international finance channels uh, if they're sanctioned or if, if other things happen, and they can actually just make payments. And so you actually see, for example, maybe countries like Iran have, have dabbled in that to some extent uh, because it, it does offer that kind of technology basis for them. And, and people might think that's good or bad, but that's just Bitcoin is. Uh, and so you, you could start to see countries maybe hold a little bit of it. Uh, but I think overall, it's, it's one of those things where it generally has to be a little bit bigger before most uh, central banks would even really kind of consider it. We see, I mean, interesting news out of, out of uh, El Salvador, right? So that's it's legal tender. Uh, and so they're going to have some in their fund. Uh, and so that is pretty interesting there. That's kind of a, a, you know, kind of a certainly not something I expect to happen in 2021. And so that's actually pretty interesting. And so I mean, maybe maybe it's one of those things where I'm saying, I don't think a, a major central bank's gonna hold it in the next two years, but who, who knows if it gets big enough, 
you can start to get surprises like that.